And what's going on, people? Let a few get up on here. This fine, fine Thursday evening. How's everyone doing this evening? If y'all can't tell, I've got some new <clears throat> electronics tonight. Um, everything should look uh, as normal as possible with me in the picture. Um, using my wife's new iPhone. It's got the uh, mirror imaging, so all of my lettering and stuff I do uh, should be uh, turned the right direction. If y'all have a problem hearing me, let me know. Um, like I say, this is a new uh, phone and everything, so I'm not sure how the uh, audio is on it yet. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I'll be going over a lot about the springs and stuff and what to do uh, with this uh, AKRA stuff. Uh, I'm just going to kind of hit the high, you know, the high parts. Uh, I'm not going to really go into a whole lot of detail. Um, builders don't like me doing that, but I'm going to kind of um, hit the high spots on how to set your um, installed height on your springs on heads, you know, using your AKRA, NKA style engines. Um, it's simple. Um, you know, all you need is, you know, one little tool. Uh, the little tool that we use, uh, you can get from, uh, this one actually came from Rick's Rockets. I don't know if you can see it on there. It says Rick's on there. Um, but you can also get them from uh, Larry Jones Motorsports. Uh, they sell a good one. Um, uh, very inexpensive. It's the 815 installed height gauge. Um, and, and what this actually measures, for those of you that don't know, and I know a lot of you are going to know this. This is routine stuff for you but there. Still a whole lot of people out there that um, that don't know about setting install height. They don't understand why their engines won't turn, but, you know, 63, 6400, even with no springs on it. Um, that's because they don't, they don't set their installed height right. There's a minimum that you set this, and what the installed height actually is, is the height between the floor right here where the spring goes inside the head up to the retainer while the retainer is actually on the valve. That, where my thumb is right there, is the spring height. That is what we're setting at 815 minimum. That means it can't be any shorter than 815, 815 thousandths. And that's where this gauge here comes in. Um, I'm going to do my best to try to show you how to set this tonight um, up here. So just kind of bear with me. Uh, one thing I do that makes this a, a whole lot easier, get you a pair of you know older needle nose pliers, put them in the vise, heat them up with a torch, and bend them. This is what I use to hold the uh, the retainer up so that I can get my gauge underneath it. This is a lot easier to do with the head off the engine. That way you can hold your valves up. You got to worry about them falling in the engine. I know a lot of times at the track, when they're checking this stuff at the track, they don't take the head off, which is fine. That's what you're supposed to do. But when you're setting it on a new engine, um, it's, it's best to do it with the head off. And like I say, you can use a pair of straight needle nose, but these work a whole lot better for getting down in there. And what you want to do is you want to... This is going to be weird for me because it goes the opposite way of what I want it to do. Uh, you're going to use it to hold the retainer up so that you can get your gauge under there. And this is a brand new head with a brand new valve. And my cat's getting up here now and going to mess with me. Go away. Nobody wants to see you. All right, all, simply all you do is just slide the gauge between the retainer and the head. And as you see, that went in fairly easy and there's a lot of slop in it. It goes up and down a lot. There's a lot of room to make improvements there. And the way we close that up is the engines come with these little 
these are called valve seals that's what they're actually called but we don't use them for seals anymore we use them for shims um, one trick I will tell you about um, if you get a you know a reamer or you can use a drill bit um, or a flex home right in here this area of it right here is rubber and if you get a you don't want to drill it out really really big make it noticeable some people don't care if you cut this rubber out but some tech guys do um, the one thing I will tell you to do is get you a, I use a reamer and run the reamer through it and it opens that hole up so that it doesn't drag on the valve because see stock this thing has a lot of drag and it holds the you know it's, it's a lot of drag on the valve and that's you know that's, that slows the engine down I don't have none here that I've actually honed out this is my spare box that I got here but you can use a reamer home it out or, or a slightly oversized drill bit and what that does is that opens that rubber up and what you want it to do is when you do it like that and hold it you want the valve to fall out of it this is we don't use them for seals anymore we're using them for shims this area of the lip right here is what the spring rides on we'll use it for a shim now so the user the first thing I do after I do my three angle valve job and you know if I sink the valves or whatever this is, this is what you do after all that do your valve job first lap them in all that is set now you're setting your installed height I start out with a single valve shim valve seal whatever and um, you know go back to gauging it again hold it up you want to hold it good and level and you just want to be able to slide the gauge right in there and that one went in again fairly easy um, but you what you want you want to have to work it in there because when the valves are new when the seats are freshly um, seated and lapped and all you're gonna lose a thousandth or so after everything wears in and breaks in after it runs a little while so you want to have to when you get done with this with all your shims you want to have to force it in on a new head that way after it runs it slides in real good and tight like it's supposed to but it's not too tight but it has your clearances close enough to where it helps control valve flow all right and you know, like i say that that's still a little bit loose we sell other cart shops sell, you can get them most anywhere, shims that go under the valve springs. We have them in all different sizes. We have them down as, as small as five thousandths. We got them in ten thousandths, twenty-five, thirty, and sixty. Um, and you, you'll use the shims underneath the, uh, the seal. You want the seal to sit on top you put the spring you know, the shims underneath it and you know you keep stacking shims and working with it until you get a really good tight fit under there um i was going to actually do this head but i've been outside cutting grass and i literally come in and run through the shower to come here and do this i got about four and a half acres i keep cut here at my house all that along with building engines and stuff is, is my Grass was so tall that I about lost my kid going to school this morning. All right, let's put a little shim under it, see if we can get it tight. All right. But again, like I say, get your pair of needle nose, bend them over, makes this a whole, whole lot easier. All right, see those? I put a 25,000 under it, it's a little too tight. Again, what you're looking for is you want to have to to wiggle it in and force you know for not not have to hammer it in but have to put some good effort to push it in you want it to slip in and click in real hard that's what you're looking for um and that can be achieved with you know shims like i said we got them from 10 uh, from five to sixty thousandths um most car shops have them we have them they're easy to get uh, something else you can do is you know, get you a get you a good selection of retainers. This is the intake retainer here. The reason I say that is because these retainers also have different thicknesses on them. You can take ten retainers and get eight different readings on this. That's just part of made in China. Um, I, I suggest everybody has you know eight, nine, or ten laying around when you're trying to do this. And what you're looking for, as far as the thickness, this is going to be hard to do here. 
this area right here I don't know if you can see it um, you'll notice that from this area to the top sometimes are a little deeper sometimes are a little shallower and the ones of course that in this area right here that are shallower sit down lower on the valve a few thousands the ones that are a little bit deeper sit up a little bit higher the reason I say you need to do that is because it's, it's impossible to use one retainer and get shims and get your valve setting exactly where you want it. You're going to have to settle. Um, what we do, I go through six, seven, eight different retainers and look at them and I have some set aside that's a little bit, a little bit deeper in this area right here and some that's a little bit shallower. And, you know, I'll know that if I get my you know, I put a ten, uh, 5,000 shim in there and it's a little bit loose and I put a 10,000 in there in the place of the five, it's a little bit tight. I can go find one of those retainers that's got a little bit deeper um, uh, cutout in it and get my install height exactly where I want it. And that's the same on both sides. Here's the exhaust retainer. It's a lot easier to see in this one because it's, it's got a bigger hole for the lash cap. You'll notice that this area right up in here it's got a deeper inset and a shorter inset. That's something a lot of a lot of builders and people don't tell you. Um, you know, not like I'm trying to sell parts here. I'm just trying to to help you get these things set exactly where you need them to because it's it's very very hard using just one retainer and and the shims that you got here. Um, I know people that you know they use one and they'll take you know the valve seal if it's a little tight and they'll they'll sand it down and. I, if that's what you want to do it that's fine it all comes out the same in the end but it's just easier and these things are very inexpensive and that way you can get your install height set dead on where you need it because that's very very important when it comes to you know controlling valve flow um, something else I'll tell you when it comes to you know valves and, and retainers and stuff we have of course I showed you this is the standard uh, intake retainer we now have lightweight retainers. They're a little bit lighter weight, and when it comes to these stock engines, lighter is better. The lighter you can get things, the better things are going to be. The better you're going to have the springs control your valve float, the more RPMs you're going to be able to turn. It's better all the way around. Um, on average, I've weighed several of these in many different times. On average, the lightweight ones are about a gram lighter than the originals. Um, some's a little bit lighter, some's a little bit heavier. There again, it's a product of China. But on average, it's about an ounce lighter, excuse me, about a gram lighter, not an ounce, that's a lot, a gram lighter than the original. Um, that goes the same for the exhaust retainer, the one that takes the little lash cap in there. They're about a, about a gram lighter on average. Some's a little more, some's a little less. Um, but getting back to the valves, um, setting your installed height is key. I mean, you've got to have that on. And, you know, it's, what's the old saying? It's got to be on point. you got to have that installed height as close to 815 as you can get it. Because if it's not, I don't care whose springs you're running, even if they're a little bit stronger, you're not going to get the RPMs that you need out of these little engines. And, and you know, having multiple sets, I ain't saying, I ain't saying you got to have, you know, a container like this full like I do you know but I'd have six seven eight ten of each you know laying over there that I can go through and after I've used three or four or five I'll buy three or four or five more very inexpensive if you're doing a lot of engines you know even if you're doing your own it, it helps to have some on the side to go through I mean because they thought with you know using the shims and stuff it would do away with that but it, it really does and if you want to get it dead on where it needs to be you need a few extra and I will also say that under the AKRA rules, um, you can only run 74 thousandths thickness on the shims. And that's including this and the shims. They take them out, they, whatever you got in, they take them out, they stack them up, and they measure them. And I believe it's 74 thousandths. I could be wrong. It's something... I haven't paid much attention to. I, you you rarely have to use that many. That's why I don't pay much attention to it. Um, I don't believe NKA has a rule on that. You can use what you want, but 
rarely do you will you need more than 40 45 thousandths rarely i've never had to use that many and that's including you know sinking the valve all i could sink it you know and finding really short valves and all and you rarely have to use more than about 40 or 45 thousandths total um the other thing i want to warn you about with these heads <clears throat> just like the retainers just like any parts that we get for these clones that come from overseas there's differences in the heads this is one of the new 181 heads y'all can see there well i can give y'all numbers and the way they're supposed to look now the exhaust which is this side right here god this is weird if you notice it has a completely round shelf right here where the spring sits it's round all the way around and the the the, the shims and all will sit down on it and you got to worry about you know stacking them odd and all it's got the same shelf that the intake has it's round everything sits down on it good the reason i say that is because some of the older heads we got and a few of the new ones that i've seen oh, where'd my head go here it is it has a little sh a little shelf this is gonna be really hard to show you here if you look uh, you see it right there you got the shiny part and then you see that dull part right here that's an there's a lip there see it grabs my pencil that only fits these shims they'll go down in there and they'll fit inside that shiny area and that's all the fit in there the reason i say that is a lot of these shims even the specialty shims that we have are a little bigger than that area little shelf right there you see it and this shim will sit on top of that and it'll sit sideways um, so what I do on heads it's got that little shelf I put the seal down first and then lay my springs my shims over the top of it because they fit right over it and go in there and that way everything is sitting level and you don't have no springs that's cockeyed and pulling your valve to one side and this that and the other um let's see i got three or four, i got too many heads up here so like i say this one as i showed you before everything is is, is flush there is no shelf on it your shims will sit flat your seal will fit flat there's no worry about it um I'm just just making you aware of that so that you know, you don't have no shim sitting in there cockeyed and it, it causes your spring to keep your valve pulled to the side and wears your guides out and it ain't gonna blow your engine up, but it can cause the guide to wear out a little quicker than it needs to. Um, uh, again, Rick's Rockets, I think, um, yeah, Rick's Rockets and uh, Larry Jones. This is a simple tool, very inexpensive. Um, that, along with a spring, you know the dead weight checker you know is if you're going to build these engines especially for the people you you, you know for other people you really need that because that's that's one of the things they check a lot um, i didn't bring my dead weight checker with me tonight but uh someone did you know ask me about you know about these uh the hd springs that we carry these are the red stripe i don't know if you can see them good 1055 hd these springs when they come out of the pack are about a pound heavier than what they need to be as far as AKRA and KA rules. These are what I call builder springs or, you know, cheater springs if you want to call them that, but they're designed for builders. And what we do with them is, you know, we put them on the dead weight checker and a spring um, poundage gauge and we set them exactly where we want them at. Um, and the way, there's several ways you can set them, but the way I do it is I'll actually use a belt sander. I use my crankshaft polisher. I just put a stiffer belt on it and hold my hand up there. But I grind it, and I say this is a belt. Actually, it's a Samsung phone, but the belt's turning. I just set the spring down for a second, spin it, set it down for a second, spin it, set it down for a second, and and grind it off. And then I go over to a, I got a, a aluminum block with some paper uh, uh, fastened to it, 
and I just kind of rub it back and forth with my hands and kind of polish it up. Go back to my spring checker, you know, I wash it off, cool it off, you don't want it hot. Cool it off, put it back on my dead weight, check it, and um, I get it to where I can just barely, barely, barely see light through it, which is a touch. It actually will be kicked out in tech, but I want it. I don't want no bounce. I just want to barely see light through it. Then I put them in the engine because after they run, they're going to lose a few tents. After the night, boom, they're dead on. Um, but see, this one has been ground. You notice that side still got the coating on it. And that side's shiny. This one, this one has been ground, and this one has been um, ground and set. It's set on about 10.9 pounds, maybe a tenth over. You can barely see light through it. Um, you don't want them new going in the engine. This is just me, in my opinion. This is not. I'm not telling you this as as written in stone, but I want my springs just a touch over what they need to be, so that by the you know. They'll last a couple of races, but if you set them dead on, you're already a couple of tenths of a pound behind after that, you know, before you get, even get to the second race. And these springs should last you two races, even turning 67, 68, 69. I run them four. I've got engines that's got four races on these, turning 68, 69. Um, there's some other springs out there that, that are they're just as good. These are the Dino Red Stripes. We'll get them from Dino, and, and whatever. But, um, there's some out there that won't last but one race. There's some out there that'll last four or five races, but you know, buy a quality spring, set them right, and with your installed height and all like I showed you, and and you'll get good life out of the springs, and you ain't got to change them every race. Some people like to change them every race. You're prerogative, um, whatever. But one thing that helps these springs last a long, you know, longer, not a long time, is Every time you fire the engine up, whether it's for five minutes in your shop or a 50 lap race at the track, when you shut the engine off, rotate the engine around to the compression stroke. That's, you know, you'll feel the engine turn with the rope, feel it turn easy, it'll get hard, go right past the compression release, and you want to stop it right there. What that does is that stops the spring, I mean, that stops the engine with both the valves closed. And you know, the head temp on these things is 400 plus degrees. So is the spring. And everyone knows how we shape metal. You get metal hot, you bend it to a shape, when it cools, it holds that shape. These springs are the same way. If you stop that engine after 10, 15, 20 laps on the track, that <clears throat> the head temp's at 400 degrees, and you stop it and one of the valves are open. That spring sits like that, hot, until you turn the engine over again, which that might be the last race of the night, or it might be, you know, after qualifying, and then you're going to go sit in the trailer for two hours between your next race, and that spring is compressed. When you go back out, it's going to lose a little tension. Hey, hey buddy, how are you? Um, somebody got a hold of a marker, didn't they? You have a mustache and a goatee now. I hope that was not a sharpie. Okay. Um, it looks good on you. It looks good on you. I'm, I'm not really sure whether to be proud or not here, but it looks good on you. Can, can you close the door and give me a few more minutes? Can you say bye? No. You can't say bye? You know, people are here to see me, not you. I hope they're here to see me. You want... Okay, now he's getting in his car and driving off. Good job. My three-year-old has a permanent marker mustache now. <laughs> Yay. Anyway, like I say... They stop like this, they're going to compress, and they're going to lose tension. Uh, they may not lose a pound right then, but it's, it's going to cause them to lose tension, especially if you do it every time it's fired up. And I don't care if it's fired up in your shop or at the track. Turn over compression stroke, release the springs. They cool in a more relaxed position. It helps add life to them. Um, okay. Uh, what was that so I'm going to go over? Or install heights of stock heads. Hey, buddy. Is this going to be one of those nights? Sorry. He's all right. I don't think nobody cares. I think the marker's cute. I hope it comes off. All he needs now is a white van because he's got a perfect one of those um, mustaches. But, um,. Anyway, they left the door open, so there's no telling what y'all gonna hear now. 
he's going to get a bath. And usually that turns into screen time for some reason. I don't know. He used to love baths. Now he don't. I don't know. I guess it's a man thing or something. Um, all right. I was going to go over a little bit of uh, coal vine. Um, anybody got any questions? Let me go back here and look at this on the install file. I got a bunch of questions here. Holy crap, I got a lot of questions. So I can't see these as good on this as I used to on my tablet because it's a little bitty screen like this. My tablet used to be big. Uh, hi, you guys. No problem. Appreciate it. Glad we could do it for you. Yeah, Sean, that's what I just went over uh, with the spring. Like I say, they are over. If you get the red HD springs from us, always check them. Unless you're running them, you know, backyard, mini bike, or <laughs> want to cheat springs, you know, then you ain't got to check them. But AKRA, you need to check them. Jeff, I don't have a home to home these with. Yeah. But I was just telling you what you need to do. Trying to help you gain some horsepower there, buddy. Of course, you run a 206, you don't need help getting horsepower. Prepping tires while you're watching. My man's got some priorities right there. Uh, Dakota, uh, jetting on a gas 390. Your guess is as good as mine, buddy. I know of very few people that's got the 390s to run consistently on gas. Um, I can build 10 of them. Two of them are run good, and eight of them, um, I go out there and, and, and sit on top of Tannerite and, and shoot it with my AR and blow it up. That's how irritating they get me. Um... I'd probably start, I'd use the stock 390E tube, um, start somewhere probably between 28 and 30-ish on the low side, and 42 to probably 44 on the main is usually where I start, the ones that run good, that's where they are. Um, if you're going to use pump gas, need to be somewhere around 30, 31, maybe 32 degrees timing, um, depending on what fuel you're using, but that's the jetting I use on the ones that actually run right. Um, I build nothing the same and it, it won't run, it won't idle, it won't do nothing. And um, I'd have to go to anger management the next day. But that's what I do for the ones that run right. I'll get back to it in just a minute here, folks. I wanna go through a cockeyed shim, ain't that a country song? It might be in Illinois, It ain't. it ain't here in Georgia. Do I set my springs different for road racing versus dirt racing? Well, Jeff, since you're a road racer, I'm not going to tell you that. No, I set the springs exactly the same. Um, I do put new springs in after every race because a road race, one road race is like almost half a season on a dirt race. Um, the road racing that I've done, um, you run 30-minute races. You run you know 10-minute practices and you run a 30-minute race. If you figure up how many laps, you know, how fast you run a lap on a dirt track, we'll say an average of 15 seconds, and how many laps you run a night, do that in the minutes. A one road race is like almost half a season on dirt races. So I set them up the same, but I change the springs after every day. We run two days. After I practice on Friday, I change the spring. I race on Saturday, change the spring. And then, you know, race on Sundays. But I set them up the same. Shannon Portwood is on here? Man, ain't it your bedtime? I probably shouldn't have mentioned that Tannerite. Now folks going to be blowing up carburetors saying, Jody said blow them up with Tannerite. <laughs> Just make sure that when you do that it's on top and watch where it goes because it goes way, way up in the air and you'll lose sight of it and it'll come down and hit somebody in the head. Um, not that we do anything like that, you know. <laughs> All right, um, now I need to go over a little bit of coal bind. This is something I talk about a lot. You know, I ask people on the phone, you know, what, what, yo, Jody. That's the best you could do is yo. You couldn't say, you know, good evening or hi, how you doing? It's yo. Sound like some beer cans talking there.
Well, Jeff, um, I could really be a, a, <laughs> a smart ass right here, but I'm not. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to keep it professional. But um, I change the springs after every, every race because that's a lot of, a lot of time on them. Uh, but anyway, on the phone, people call up and uh, talking about different cam combos we can use with, you know, um, one to three rockers and yada, yada, yada. And a lot of times people are using the Hemi head. For those of you who have never seen one, this is a Hemi head. It's got, I didn't, I don't have the valve cover with me, but it's got a, a square aluminum valve cover. Um, but this is the inside of it. The rockers are shaft mounted. There's a pin that goes through here that holds them and rotate on the shaft where the non-Hemi Predator and the clone use, you know, um, stud rockers. There's a ball that goes on here and you tighten it up and it rotates. But anyway, this is the Hemi head. Um, this is, I, I really, really like this head a lot in, in like stock appearing applications and even some outlaw stuff, but I really like it in stock appearings. Um, because of the way the head design is. You know, the, the, the valves are angled, which gives you, when you port it, really good flow, really good port velocity. It's easy to tune. Um, it's easy to make run good. Um, but there again, one of the drawbacks to it is that it has angled valves. The angled valves is good and angled valves is bad. The reason the angled valves are bad is with higher lift cams, you run into some piston to valve contact with these if you do a whole lot of milling here and you set your piston at zero, you have to really be careful. A lot of people have gotten into, you know, fly cutting the piston. That's where you cut valve release in the piston so that the valve actually goes into the piston a little bit without actually contacting it. Um, but that's one of the bad things about the Hemi. Another bad thing about it is the installed height on it is way shorter than the non-Hemi Predator and the clone engines are. So valve spring choice and cam lift comes into a whole lot of play with this with this Hemi engine. Um, you're running a 308 in the Hemi, a lot of times people don't realize it, but the exhaust side is shorter than the intake side, and both of them are way shorter than the clone. But with a 308 and even with a 26 pound spring, a lot of time they're coil binding on the exhaust side. And what I mean by coil binding is, you know, the spring will actually collapse all the way and be dead solid before the cam is, is at full lift, meaning something's got to give. If that spring is all the way collapsed and that cam still has, you know, 20, 30 more thousandths of lift, you're bending push rods, you're flexing push rods, you're, you're, you're bending... Um, uh, rocker arms. That's how a lot of them break is people are, are coil binding them and something's got to give and after a, a while it ain't going to break first thing. A lot of times on the Hemi head if it coil binds hard enough it's going to kick the rocker arm or the, the uh, push rod out the back of it. People call up all the time I can't keep the push rods in. I'm trying to set the lash and it keeps kicking the push rods out. Check your valve springs. More than likely it's because of coil bind. And another area here comes the screaming. Now, he may run through here naked. I just want to warn y'all. Um, when he gets out the tub, for some reason, it's off to the races, and he does it. Buck J naked. And if he runs through, just ignore him, because the more you laugh at him, pointing, the more he stops and shakes his hiney at you. Um, I don't know where he got that from. Probably me. But, um, I forgot what I was talking about now. Don't talk about nudity around me. I just forget what I'm talking about. Um, oh, coal mine. Um, a lot of people, I try to talk a lot of people out of the 308 cam when it comes to these Hemis. If you talk to me on the phone on the 308, I've always tried to talk you down to, you know, 275 grind or, you know, the Mod 2 or the BP2 um, because of the coal mine thing, you know. And the Hemi also, the way it's made in there, the springs actually sit inside of a little cup and they, they wrap around the head actually wraps around the spring they sit down in a little shelf which helps hold the spring straight which is good but a 26 pound spring is as big of a spring as you can put in one without cutting uh, where the spring area goes bigger um, you know we got you know, this is a 10.8 spring basically stock this is a 26 pound spring you know, a lot, you see the coals are a lot bigger 
a lot stiffer spring. Um, this will handle, you know, a lot of RPMs. We've got a 22 pound spring that'll also work in a heavy head. You know, same, about the same height and all as a stock spring is. It's just got thicker coils on it. 26 is a little bit shorter, but it's really beefy. One of the springs I like to use is the 36 pound spring. This spring here will handle, you know, 8,500, 9,000 plus with most cams. Uh, F275, about 82, 84. Um, but the drawback to this spring in the Hemi is how much bigger around it is. It won't fit down in these pockets. And you'll have to cut the pockets out bigger to make the spring go in. So the 26, without head work, is all the stiffest spring you can use in this engine without it, without having to cut the pockets out. A lot of people call up and say, um, you know, I want to run some 18 pound springs and here comes, here comes new boy. Actually, he's in his little John Deere car now riding around naked. Um, let me go shut this door so I ain't got to listen to that. Sorry, kids, we was all that age one time, right? Uh, and they want to run 18 pound springs. I say, I want a mod two cam and some 18 pound springs. Well, the 18 pound spring won't work in the Hemi head, even with a stock cam. The reason why is it's a whole lot taller than a stock spring. This is a, a regular 10.8, this is a 26, and this is an 18. 18 is a whole lot taller. This is a genuine Honda spring. This 18 pounds at, you know, whatever. Um, they're good on Mod 2 cams. You know, um, you know, maybe the CM cam are good with these, but you can't use them in a Hemi head because of the short installed height. And like I was saying, if you see, this is an 18 pound spring with a stock valve and a stock retainer in a Hemi head. You see how close the coils are together? That will coil bind on a stock cam. Just an OEM, out the box, straight from China cam. Let's see if I can get some light in here. Damn, that don't work. But uh, that'll coil bind on a stock cam. You cannot run the 18 pound springs that we sell in a Hemi head. Uh, there's some other places out there that's, that's got some 18 pound springs. Um, you know, I think it's the 22 pound spring that we sell and they cut them down a little bit more to make an 18. Those will work fine. But the 18 pound springs that we sell, they will not work in a Hemi head even with a stock cam because, yeah, that's close to coal bind right here. This side has a 22 pound spring in it. If you notice, if you can see, there's a lot of room between them coals. This will handle about, probably about 280, 285 thousandths, maybe 290 lift. You might can get, you know, the CM cam, you know, the Mod 2s, the BP2s. You, could, you might can get 290, 300 thousandths out of, out of the 22s. I know you can get, you know, 300 out of the intake side um, with the 26s, the exhaust side's a little shorter. Um, but, um, like I say, 18, 22s. 90% of the time, if you're on a Mod 2, BP2, or the CM style cam, I'm going to recommend the 22 pound springs to you. Um, the F275, the 308, you're going to run the 26s. Um, that's, that's your only spring options on a Hemi head without doing spring pocket work. Um, now, back, you know, back to the coil bind thing, people's asked me, you know, how do you measure coil bind? Um, what are you, you know, what are you looking for? What you're looking for is you want to put the spring in there, you want to put the, the you know, the, you want to have the head on it, you want to have the rockers on it, you want to set the rockers to zero lash, you want to rotate the engine around until the spring is at, you know, until the cam is at full lift, which means, you know, you'll see the, the, the rocker arm go all the way down, and if it starts coming back up, rotate the engine back to where it's all the way down, full lift on the cam. 
and you want to measure in between the coils and you want no less than I don't like any less than 60 um, what I use to measure coil bind is a standard um, zip tie it's a plastic zip tie like what you zip tie something to the side of your go-kart wheel and when you bust your body you know you drill holes in it zip tie it together or you zip tie you know, your hose to it or whatever just a plastic zip tie most of them measure about 65 to 70 thousandths um and i use the zip tie i got it cut short i roll the engine down if i can stick the zip tie in at least two places you know above and below you're good um anything less than that you know you want to get some act you can't get that zip tie in, you want to get something that measures it a little more accurately to make sure that you know you don't have anything less than 60. Um, some people run less than that I just like 60 um, because you might get in a situation where you know you over rev the engine or you turn it you miss the gearing or something like that and you want to turn the engine 74 and you wind up turning it 77 or 78 just in case those valves float a little bit you don't want them floating and, and, and the coils banging together um, because when that happens and they coil bind because they're being slung together um, it, it can break the spring um, you know or something else but I, I like at least 60 and you can use a standard uh, zip tie run it down just see if you can stick it through in two or three places that's a simple way to check coal bind a lot of people do it you know with more high-tech tools but I'm not a high-tech person I work for a high-tech company I'm just not a high-tech person I you know I, I make a lot of my own tools still here in the back by area with a with a with a vice and a torch and just heat them up bend them over and the heck with buying some $30 pliers. I can make them myself. And that's why I do these shows to, to show people that there's a simpler way to do all this. You don't have to, you know, have a machine shop like what ARC's got to build this stuff. I mean, you can do a lot of this stuff simply, easily. I say this every show. I say it at least four times. I'm going to say it four times in a row. This ain't rocket science. This ain't rocket science. This isn't rocket science. This is not rocket science. I said it four different ways, or three different ways. Who cares? It ain't rocket science. Make your own tools. Be creative. You know, um, find ways to measure things. If you have to use a zip tie, that's fine. I use it. It's good enough for me. It's good enough for ARC. It's good enough for you. Um, now that I've gone over that, I completely forgot what I was going to say next. Oh, yeah. Still on the coal bind thing. A lot of people want to use <clears throat> stock cams and ratio rockers you know like our little little stamp one to threes we got <clears throat> or we got the um the billet one to threes with the roller tip and we've also got you know the true roller rockers that gauge sells and makes the black venoms um but a lot of people like using these little stamp ones they're cheap and easy to use they'll use them on a mod 2 cam they use them on a stock cam you know or a cl2 <clears throat> but two places where people mess up and they wind up breaking things is Again, they're trying to run 18 pound springs, which is a tall spring, with a ratio rocker. And what a ratio rocker does is a stock lift cam is average of 240 thousandths lift, plus or minus, ain't arguing. We're going to say 240. When you put this one to three rocker on it, it adds 30% lift to the end of the, of the valve, which means, you know, before it was 240 total lift when you put this uh i'm in the middle of a show people stop calling me i will call you back when you take a stock cam and put one to three rockers on it you add 30 percent more lift so that's 240 times 1.3 which is your ratio that's going to put you around 300 lift between 290 300 somewhere in that area um which is too much for an 18 pound spring um it's going to coil bind it even in a clone head, even if you cut the spring pockets, it's going to be close to because the spring is like right there, as you see when it's in the head. You know, you you can run these on a mod two in a non hemi or in a, a clone style head, but you put ratio rockers on it, she's going to coal bind every time. Um, they mess up there by not checking their coal bind or not thinking about it or not knowing about it. Now you know, watch the video. But another place they mess up is the guide plate. When you when you put these ratio rockers on, the way they change the ratio, they don't is they 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 move the push rod closer to the stud. 
Here's a stock rocker. Here's a ratio rocker. Right, let me get them even here now. And this is weird. See how much shorter to the uh, rocker stud this one is? That's how they change the ratio. It moves the push rod in closer to the stud, which puts more pressure on the back of the rocker arm. Um, but what it also does is it moves the, the push rod in. It, it leans it in just a little bit. And if you're running stock guide plates, it's going to hit the plate when it goes to full lift because you know you're sitting you're sitting like this and as the push rod goes up you know it it, it kind of moves in just a little bit and it's going to hit the guide plate and a lot of times pop it out the back and i get people calling me up saying Man, i bought these rocker arms from you i can't keep the push rods in it you know you sold me something wrong this that and the other and all it was was they didn't get a guide plate so our people on the phones, you know, me and David and Taylor that said yo to me a while ago, Jamie, you know, we have notes in our things that when somebody orders these to make sure that they have something like this because these go together. Um, you know, we, we could make a kit out of it, I guess, you know, but a lot of people like to order things singly. But this guide plate is a must when you're using, you know, the stamped uh, rockers. Now, if you go to a gauge rocker, a true roller rocker, you know, like we use, you don't have to use a guide plate with it. Um, you take the guide plate completely off. I don't run a guide plate on none of mine because where the uh, the uh, push rod goes into the, the rocker is cupped and it holds it really nice like it's supposed to and I've never had a problem with it. I don't run no guide plates on any of my gauge rockers. Those of y'all that do, sorry, I just don't. Never have, never will until I have a problem. But Ratio rockers, you must change the guide plate, and you cannot run 18-pound springs that you buy from ARC in there. If you're going to run ratio rockers, you're going to run the 22-pound spring, the 26-pound spring, or the 36-pound spring. If you've got a clone head, a Honda head, or a non-hemi head. Um, now, ratio rockers in a hemi head is a whole other discussion. I may do that next time. Because I can talk an hour on that on things that need to be done. we got some good rockers for them, but there's things that's a lot different about putting rockers on them than it is, you know, for these standard heads. Um, while I'm on the subject of valve springs, real quick, I need to also let y'all know that um, if you order, you know, if you're going to run stainless valves, you know, you you got to run the stainless, uh, the billet retainers that we got on the stainless valves. And we got two sets of retainers. One set of retainers, the 1046s, will work with the 22 pound spring, and it will work with the 26 pound spring. And then the 1047s that we got only work, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. I said that wrong. The 1047s will work with the 26 and 22s. Getting ahead of myself here. The 1046s only work with the 36 pound spring. Somebody's got that rolling wrong. That's why I got that wrong. David Simpson wrote two numbers on here. How about that? I'm always calling you out, man. <laughs> but the 46s, the, like I said before, the 36 pound spring is a bigger inside diameter than the 26 is. So the retainer has to be able to fit the spring good, you know, so that it don't walk around. Um, and as you see, it won't even go inside the 26. That's where you have to use the 47. It'll fit inside the 22. It's made for the 22 and the 26 pound spring. Smaller ID, fits it good. I mean, it'll it'll go inside the, the 36, but see all that movement? That's going to be moving back and forth. So, 36 pound spring, which is a DJ 1057, takes the 1046 retainer. Uh, the 22s, which is a DJ 1058, and the 26s, a DJ 1056, take the 1047. So, make sure that we get the right retainers with the right springs. Because if not, uh, 
you're gonna run into some problems. Alright, uh, and I don't, if you're gonna go to stainless valves and stuff like that, which means you're going to a pretty aggressive cam, uh, you're probably gonna run some ratio rockers. Don't waste your time with 18 pound springs. These are good springs for you know CL2 cheater springs. You know, for those of you who like to run cheater AKRA stuff. Um, you know, these springs will get your RPMs up to well over 7,000 without having to worry about installed height and stuff. They just, they'll do it. Um, but they're illegal. These are not legal for AKRA. Um, they're, but they're a cheater spring for that. Or if you want to run like the Mod 2, um, mini bike engine, stuff like that. On the Mod 2, these springs will handle, you know, 71, 72. Um, but to me, the best all around middle of the road spring is the 22 um on the mod 2 cam uh bp2 the cm cam the, the 275 lift cam these 22 pound springs they'll work in any head out there hemi head non-hemi and they'll they'll handle you know 74 75 76 anything above the cm cam which is you know the the f275 308 and up you're gonna need a 26 or a 36 um but that is kind of in a nutshell. Okay, I forgot to mention the uh, dual springs that we carry also. Uh, spring with inside of a spring for those of you who had never seen them. That's why they're called dual springs because there's two springs on them. Um, but the beauty of the dual spring kit is it comes with its own retainer. So you ain't got to worry about getting the right retainers with it. You just order a 6168 dual spring kit. comes with a retainer. Now this is something you're going to run on an F275. Um, with ratio rockers or anytime you run a, a, a F275 and up cam with or without ratio rockers. Um, you need good dual springs. If you want high RPMs, this is your ticket. All right. Um, talked about that. Talked about that. The lightweight retainers. Oh, while well, I'm on the subject of lightweight, we've also got lightweight lifters for these AKRA style engines. Um, I measured these and they average right at two grams lighter than stock. The way you can tell them is you see one's really shiny, you see the machine work on it, and one's got the dull finish. The lightweight ones, I only recommend these for like AKRA, NKA type, you know, we run a 10 8 spring where you gotta have the lightest available valve train. These, uh, any type of modification, you know, backyard stuff. You're running mini bikes, you know, drag racing, karting, big cams, heavy springs, run a standard lifter. I've never seen one of these break, but these have been machined down. They're a little thinner. I don't know. I hadn't run anything yet. I hadn't really tested on anything other than AKRA. I got them in several AKRA engines, and they do help. Um, these are available now. The lightweight lifters and the retainers are available now at ARC. Um, but... Any modifications to the camshaft springs, you need to run a standard um, lifter. I know I kind of blubbled all that together, but um, go back and do some questions here. <sighs> no, I'm never a smart ass, am I? Um, Boone, what kind of clearance are you talking about? Um, you see, you ask how much clearance do I need? Are you talking about coal bind clearance? Because I said. You know, I usually I usually like no less than sixty, um, if that's what you was talking about. Stock retainer is good to use for those single thirty sixes, mm. with a mild cam. Um, if you're using like a mod two, I'd say yeah. Anything above a mod two with thirty six pound springs, you need stainless steel um, valves with billet retainers. Dang, David got his wife watching tonight. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, the thirty sixes, they'll handle over four hundred lift. Um, I've got some stuff out there, uh, three oh eights, you know, with some, you know, one to twos and even one to threes, uh, with twenty the thirty six pound springs. They turn them about. 82 84 um but they'll handle they'll handle 400 lift um but if you're gonna run anything with that much lift i highly recommend a dual spring you know cutting the seat pocket down so you can you know set your coil by but you know, they'll handle these will handle 400 lift 
Um, and they're they're a good spring. I use these a lot, an awful lot. Um, all right, dang, how long have I been? Wow, it's only been an hour. All right, so uh, if there's any more questions, any more comments, any more concerns. Any more talk about my kid running through here naked? Um, sounds like he's done took a bath and went to bed. He didn't run around too much tonight. Uh, uh. Yeah, Jesse, that's that's what I was talking about a while ago. Um, that's that's why I do these videos, man, for for the little guy. You know, the the backyard racer, the 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 Saturday night local track racer that you know don't really want to compete at the national level, but you know wants to build good stuff. And you know, even though even though you know I build engines, you know myself, I still want to help people do it on their own. Um, you know, because the little tricks and stuff that we learn, you know, it's kind of hard for me to pass that stuff off on these shows um, because we, 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 not only me, but a lot of the other builders work really hard to find these little tricks and you know, they slowly get out, but I really can't talk about stuff like that, but I can really help, help these, you know, you, you, you do it yourselfers and your backyarders a lot by showing you simple, easy ways to get this stuff done you know, with common everyday tools that, you know, you don't need these big machine shops. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to start doing this, you know, of course, to promote our products, you know, you know, our flywheels, our connecting rods, you know, crankshafts and all, but also help the ones that help us, you know, because if it wasn't for, you know, the backyarders, the Saturday night racers, the mini bikers, and the national level racers, the drag racers, you know, we, we wouldn't have a business. You know, I wouldn't be sitting here doing this. I'd probably be you know, selling flowers or something, hell, I don't know, but, um, you, know, you got to help the ones that help you, and this is one of the ways, one of the biggest ways that, you know, I could, you know, pay back, you know, the people that, that supported us is to help you use the parts that you buy from us, um, don't want to get off rambling too much, I've had a lot of people get on to me about that. Yeah, you, Hunter, you'll have to you'll have to cut the seat pockets um, in any in any of the clone or predator heads if you're gonna run a 308 with one to threes in the dual springs. Um, Dino has got some dual springs that's a little bit taller, but they're bigger around. Um, these can handle, you know, 400 lift, but you're gonna have to cut the, the seat pocket down, you know, 40, 50 thousandths uh, to get your coil binding all right. Uh, but you're right on that. Yes, yeah, Scott, um, <laughs> little Jody runs around naked all the time. You've seen pictures of him standing at the window, waving at the neighbors, butt naked at the window. He's all boy, 100%. Open animal engines. Yay, yay. Big iron. Valve seats. There are two versions of valve seat. High groove and middle groove. I guess you're talking about the well, automatic retainer a while ago, and, and you're right. They. I built my first one this year after I have two blown up last year from others. Yeah, open animals, any open engine. Um, you're 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 dealing with borrowed time with any of them. I mean, you can even take these clones and animals, weld up the blocks, put all the stuff on it, and it's just if you really if you really push them, you know, for all they are and, and, and getting all the power out of them, it's just a matter of time. You know, these blocks, you know, they're not designed for the stuff we're using them for. Even in the stock class, they're not designed for this. And there's, you know, they're designed to hold the engine together, 3,600 RPMs, running a water pump. You revving these things up to six, seven, eight, nine thousand, 9,000, you know, 10, 12, 13 to 1 compression, all this stuff. There's so much flex going on with these blocks. Um, Years ago, and I think you might can still find it on YouTube, uh, somebody hooked up a Spintron to a Flathead Limited on a dyno. And if y'all know what a Spintron is, that's a light, that's a, a, a camera, a really high speed camera with a, with a strobe light. And it slows things down really, really slow. I mean, you can really see detail. 
And, you know, if those of you that have, those are flathead, you know, they have a lot of these air ribs, you know, they stick up tall. And it looked like an accordion on the dyno. You could literally see the block moving up and, I mean, not that much, but you could literally see it with your eyes flexing up and down at 9,000 RPM. And it's, it's a scary sight to know that we're riding with these things right here beside us, and a lot of us has scars where connecting rods have come out. That's actually from a two-cycle clutch there. But um, I know people just got marks on their arms for connecting rods and these flatheads where the blocks blew up. But we push these things way, way, way beyond the limit of what they're made for. And it don't matter how well the parts are on the inside. You know, our parts, our crankshafts and stuff are made from the best alloys money can buy. It's the same alloys we make our crankshafts out of that they make uh, uh, Nitro Funny Car crankshafts out of. You know, NASCAR crankshafts. It's the same material. We use two different materials and they use them too. Um, but when you put them inside of a block, that's not designed for that much flex. Even if you weld braces and all on it, you're still getting way more flex than what it's designed for. And, you know, it these ant opens and stuff, man, you don't borrow time. I know some people that's, you can build them, you know, what I call a mild open and make them last for a while, but if you go all out, it's just, you, you, you're, you're counting down the minutes to when something gives because of all the flex. Uh, John Bruce, uh, lawnmower pulling, um, that's becoming bigger and bigger. Um, I got a guy on my page that does a lot of lawnmower pulling that, that, um, does some really neat stuff. I can't even think of his name right now. Tyler Watts, that's him. Look up, look him up on Facebook. He does a lot of, of lawnmower pulling. Uh, Tyler Watts does some some really good, really cool stuff too. He takes you know some of our products and uses them outside of what they're made for. Um, he makes it work. He welds up crankshaft, regrinds them and all. But if you want to get a lawnmower pulling, he's the man I'd send you to. Um, you know, for I don't I don't know what engine's the best for that. I've never done it. Never built an engine for it. I just know Tyler Watts does a lot of it and I'm friends with him on Facebook and all and he he has some really cool stuff. Really cool stuff. Double the RPM, that's right. Um yeah, if you run the billet side cover on it now, you know, not you don't necessarily have to pull it apart every week. The biggest thing to look for you know, the animal block is a is a pretty decent block, um, but it, it, it still you can every once in a while catch cracks in the block before something bad happens. You know, take the tins off of it, clean it up real good, take a flashlight, shine it at all angles, and and start learning the difference between you know casting marks, which is like that right there. You see where I scratched it. You know, I was showing somebody how to tell what a casting mark is. You can take you know a little file or or a blade or something and run across it and it'll go away. If it's a crack, you keep scratching and scratching and scratching, it don't go away. It gets deeper and you know that's a crack. Start learning the difference between casting marks and cracks and a lot of times you can catch stuff like that, you know. A lot of times you can't because a lot of times it happens so fast that, you know, there's no way to catch it. I've caught several blocks this year um, that were cracked, you know, come back for rebuilds and stuff. Um, but, yeah, open stuff, man, is... It's fun. I love it. I, I, I'm an open builder. Always have been. Um, but um, I, it, it takes a lot of time, and I don't. I don't have the time to build the opens that I want too much anymore. Um, but anyway, if um, if that's it. Oh heck, I was gonna show you all this too. I know I, I plugged Rick's Rockets and and um, Larry Jones Motorsports a while ago about our little. Uh, height gauge here you can also make one out of tubing you know sorry <laughs> I did plug them at the beginning of it and they had an hour to go to your website and all but again I am trying to show people how to do things simpler um, this is just some some pipe I don't, it might be conduit it might be aluminum I'm not really sure I think it's aluminum aluminum tube that you know we just took and 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 milled flat um, you're looking we measured everything off of this, and this was, you know, five, 
I mean, excuse me, 815.4 is what this measured all the way across. Um, so we machined this one down to 815.4. Um, the only problem with this is it is aluminum, and I used it quite I used it quite a bit, uh, even when I had this, and it'll wear down. So if you're going to make something like this, you know, make sure that you have something, you know, an actual gauge to measure off of. Make it out of steel. You know, machine shops, you know, a lot of people work at machine shops. A lot of people have mills and stuff at their house, you know, turning mills and lathes and stuff, and, man, you can make this stuff easily. You know, get a round tube, get it level, and then, you know, uh, jigsaw it or bandsaw it in two. Then you got two. Give one to your friend. Um, but you can make stuff like this. But it's best to buy one, you know, this that you know is certified and helps support carding companies. How about that? <laughs> All right. I do believe that is it. I went over to Shims. Five to 50 thousandths, the lightweight retainers. Showed you how to hone out the seals to loosen up some friction. Um, hemi head, coil bind. Uh, I think that's about it, y'all. Gonna be kind of short and sweet tonight. Uh, which is my middle name, short and sweet. Let's see. Went over the two different areas in the heads here, you know, on the exhaust side. Um, but installed high these AKRAs is 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 key i had an engine on the dyno the other night um you know going back to one of my other videos that i had telling you about you know the, the stock guide plates right here you know getting them square and lined up is important because i had one on the dyno that you know 815 was right and my springs were right and i was trying to run it and it wouldn't turn but about 65 and a half 66 that's it and it would stop and it sounded like rocks was under the valve cover it was floating the valves i couldn't figure out why and i'm the one that done the video on this and why i didn't think about it i don't know that's just heat of the moment i guess but my guide plate down here was cocked a little bit and it had my rocker arms out of line with my valves you know, they was twisted to the side a little bit. And at 6,000 RPMs, that rocker arm twist to the side, it bounces and makes them float. And I loosened up my guide plate, slid it around, and tightened it down, put my rocker arms back on it, and I always rotate the engine around, watch them work up and down, and make sure they go straight. It could have been, I forgot to tighten this. You know, I always torque this down. I may not have, it might have slipped. I don't know. I just know they were out of line and it wouldn't turn. I slid them back in line, took me a few minutes, made sure everything was good, boom, uh, 7,000. Um, so, you know, making sure your 815 is right, and like the other video I done on valve tips and tricks and all, or whatever I called it, you know, making sure this guide plate is not cocked to one side, because what that does is that pushes the push rod over, which, you know, it, it, it'll twist the, the uh, rocker arm and it won't line up perfectly with the valve and cause it to rock and cause problems. All that being in line, um, 815 where it needs to be, you know, running the lightest rocker uh, retainers with lightweight lifters, all that stuff adds up to RPM. It doesn't make power. You know, you're not going to see two tenths, three tenths, whatever, out of the lifter as far as overall power. Where you will see it as, is in upper RPM power, where the valves may started, you know, a little bit of floating at, you know, 65, 66, and you had peak RPM at 6,000, and it drops off eight tenths from 6,000 to 6,800 or 6,900, whatever you want to turn it. You can go in there and make sure you install the height is right, line up your rocker arms, this lightweight stuff up here. You'll still make the same peak RPM from six, you know, from 35 to 6,000. But what you're gonna do, you're gonna have less fall off from 6,000 to 68. Uh, like the engine I took off the dyno last night, it peaked at uh, 59.50 and lost two tenths to 7,000. Um, lightweight stuff, everything's in line. Um, you know, you're not gonna see more actual horsepower, it's just not gonna use up horsepower by floating the valves earlier. Little stuff like that is what pays off, and this stuff is available to everybody. This isn't something that only builders get. You know, we sell it to everybody, and when we get it, everybody's got it. 
and it 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 helps. Little stuff adds up to big stuff. But I'm not getting any more questions. Cody Stevens, the terror of Jasper, Florida. <laughs> well, he's from not from he's from Woodville, Florida, but he races in Jasper. He's the he's the king of the run with your brums down there in Jasper. Him and old uh old James Hunter, aka the Boone. They hard to beat down there. Um, Jamie, we're not porting AKRA heads and we're probably not gonna get into it for time reasons. Um you know, all the other stuff that we make, you know, we make a hundred and twenty something variations of rods and I'm gonna say we're up to forty different flywheels that we make now. Um, it's just a time thing. Um, importing these heads, um, I don't, it's not something we're going to get into. We thought about it and we tried to work some stuff out with other people and all, and I just, I don't think we're going to get into it. One thing that we am, I, we am, listen to me. One thing that we are getting into, I may put it up on Facebook tomorrow, is we're going to start offering, um, oil clearance crankshafts and connecting rods for AKRAs. You know, stock, you know, the stock uh, max stroke crankshaft and, you know, one of the precision cast uh, stock rods for AKRA. We're going to offer a kit now. It's already been clearanced. It's got proper oil clearance on it. Everything is set. All you got to do is when you buy it, take out the package, you know, do some minor washing, cleaning it up, and torque it in. And, you know, it's going to be something to help, you know, the, the do it yourselfer. May get into short blocks doing full blueprinted short blocks later on but right now what we're going to do is offer some uh pre-clearanced rods and crankshaft as a kit you know we'll clearance that rod to that crankshaft and everything will be hunky dory uh maverick maverick that's a cool name uh we don't have any rock arms for the animals um I believe the best place to go for animal rockers is either going to be Jimbo at Faster Motors or I think Dover's got some some animal rockers. That's pretty good. Uh, Cody, the big run what you run break, a race at Nashville? I, I doubt it. I don't have an engine right now. Um, as far as a, a 275cc, I don't, I don't have an engine. I don't know if I can get one built by then. What all the other stuff I do. I'd like to. I might. Um, if not, I'll come watch you win it. Um, Jesse, if you're running a tenth mile, I'd say the ultralight one um, on pretty much any engine. Yeah, you tenth of a mile, you got to have acceleration. It's got to. It's got to come up off the corner hard. Um, <clears throat> but that's. That's up to you. My my opinion would be the ultralight. <clears throat> all right. Um. Looks like I've got all these questions here. <laughs> Most of y'all's commenting as much about my naked kid as y'all are about my products. That's cool. Ain't nothing wrong with it. I'm telling y'all, one night he's gonna come running through here naked, or toting the cat by his tail or something. You know. I'm about to start putting, I guess, uh, parental warnings on the front of my videos before they come on when he starts running through naked. Yeah. All right. Well, um, that's pretty much it in a nutshell, folks. If you... Jesse, we plan to keep up with the great products. We work every day on our great products, making our great products even greater, if that is a word. <laughs> um... We got a lot of stuff that we're looking at releasing. We just can't get around to, you know, to uh, flipping the switch on it yet. You know, a lot of reasons why. But we got stuff we're looking at releasing here, um, here in a little while. Whitfields, Whitfields, Whitfields. Oh, that's that track in North Florida. Um, went down there. Yeah, I went down there about this time last year. I think it was. It's a nice little track down there. Good track. All right, folks. Um, 
that's pretty much it. Like I say, this video is going to be uploaded in the morning to YouTube. Uh, it'll be on the Facebook page here forever and ever, I guess, until one day I, they kick me off of Facebook. Um, but uh, any questions, uh, hit us up. Uh, ARCRacing.com. 800-521-3560. Ain't that cool? Yeah, look at that. Stepping up in the technology world. Actually, this is my wife's phone, so I, I can't say I stepped up. But she stepped up. But anyway, uh, thank you all for showing up tonight. Um, I'll do this again in a couple of weeks. You know, it might be three again, but uh, we'll give you a new topic. Uh, thank you all for, for supporting us. You know, uh, ARC, like I said, we wouldn't be nobody without y'all. Um, y'all go at it this weekend, race it up. Uh, if, if you ain't on a track, you need to be at one watching. Um, thank y'all, and we'll see y'all in a few weeks. Have a good evening.